marriage is part of faith. Psalms 31, 24. Be strong and courageous, all you who put your hope in the Lord. As part of our faith series, I, I'd like to present some passages that are intended for us to walk away with just a little bit better or a little bit different view of faith than what we're used to. Joshua 17, we read this in Sunday school a few weeks back. Joseph's descendants said to Joshua, why did you only give us one tribal lot as an inheritance? We have many people because the Lord has been blessing us greatly. Lots of babies. If you have so many people, Joshua replied to them, go to the forest and clean an area for yourselves there in the land of the Pezrites and the Rephim. Because Ephraim Hill Country is too small for you. But the descendants of Joshua said, the hill country is not enough for us. And the Canaanites who inhabit the valley area have iron chariots. Both at Bethshin with its towns and Jezreel's valley. Joshua replied <laughs> to Joseph's family, that is Ephraim and Manasseh, if you have so many people and have great strength, you will not have just one allotment. Because the hill country will be yours also. It is a forest. Clear it. And its outlining areas will be yours. You can also drive out the Canaanites, even though they have iron chariots and are strong. Translate. <laughs> 21st century, we apply the Bible to our lives. There are obstacles in front of you. You have to break a sweat and get it done. Yeah, it looks like it's a tough task in front of you. They might have iron chariots. There might be a lot of trees on that land to farm that you have to clear out to make it suit worthy of farming. And I think trees might be easier than rocks sometimes. But yeah, you're, you're just going to have to Break a sweat. Get her done. As <laughs> and one thing is, you got it. It's, it's there. It's yours. You just got to go get it. Sometimes God says to us, it's yours. You just got to go get it. We want it given to us without the sweat of our brow. Because if we have to sweat, oh, we've earned it, right? It's not God's gift if we have to sweat through it. I know you guys love, come on, next slide please. Here we go, the tribal allotment. Deuteronomy 31, be strong and courageous, don't be terrified or afraid of them, for the Lord your God goes with you, he will not leave you or forsake you. Moses then summoned Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all of Israel, be strong and courageous, for you will go with this people into the land the Lord swore to give to your fathers, and it will enable them to take possession of it. God could have seen send a plague and killed all the Canaanites. He could have. He didn't. I mean, we read what he did to the Israelites, or to, excuse me, we read what he did to the Egyptians when Pharaoh wouldn't let him go. Twelve times he cast a miserable plague on them. Finally, Pharaoh said, all right, you can go. Then he recanted and went to go get him back and ran into the Red Sea, literally. Or the Red Sea ran into him. 
He could have killed the Canaanites of the land. But he wanted his people to do it. He wanted his people to reach into the depths of their soul to find courage and strength to accomplish the will that he had set forth. Because he willed that land to them. They just had to do it. The Lord gave the promised land to the children of Israel, yet they still had to conquer the land and drive out the Canaanites. Next slide, please. Not all courage is out in the open. We have this wonderful story of Judges 6. Some uh, young punk named Gideon from a small tribe of Manasseh is, is, threshing, or is, is threshing wheat in, in the mill, hiding from the Midianite bandits that want to raid the land. And an angel of the Lord comes and greets him and greets him and says, Great and mighty warrior. <laughs> I'm sure he felt like this big because he's in hiding, doing his chores in hiding where he can't be robbed. And he basically has a conversation with the angel and the conversation goes like, well, if, if, uh, if, if God's going to save us, what, what are we doing around here? Uh, hiding. From the, from the, why does God allow all this happen to us? And so Gideon runs off and prepares a, a sacrifice and brings it back. To, and and the, the angel of the Lord touches the sacrifice that has been prepared at the end of his staff. And the, poof, the smoke comes and consumes the sacrifice. Gideon realizes he's been in the presence of an angel. He's been told that he's been <laughs> positioned, called of God, to be a judge to deliver the Israelites from the raiding Moabites, or the raiding people. As he takes the information that has been given to him, the Lord says, I have something I require of you. And that's where we start off this slide at. That very night, the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull and a second bull, seven years old, two bulls, tear down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father. Tear down the altar that belongs to your father. Cut it down. Cut down the Asher pole beside it. Build a well-constructed altar to the Lord, your God, on top of this rock. Take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with wood of the Asher pole you cut down. <laughs> so Gideon took ten of his male servants and did as the Lord had told him because he was afraid of his father's household and the men of the city <laughs> to, to do it in the daytime. He did it at night. <laughs> the title of the slide is not all courage is out in the open. All right? Ponder this for a moment. God has told you that you're the next judge. That you are going to deliver Israel from persecutors. But there's an altar that stands in the way. A pagan altar that stands in the way. You need to deal with it. Think about that for a moment. God plans to do something, but there's an obstacle that's stopping you from doing just that. Notice God calls. Then there's the correction. There's, there's sin in the camp, if you will. There's a problem with your family. There's something that has to be dealt with before I can power you to the blessing and the empower you to the call to fulfill that I've given you. Then, after the correction, deliverance can come. Think about this for a moment. Moshe
most of us, we don't want to, we want to avoid conflict in our life, right? We will keep our mouth shut because we don't want to get into an argument with our spouse. We want to keep our mouth shut so we don't get in an argument with our bosses. We want to keep our mouth shut so we don't get in an argument with somebody. We don't want to be ridiculed. We don't want to be persecuted. We just don't want to deal with conflict. Yet God says, if there's sin in the house, it's got to be addressed. It's got to be addressed. The next morning... (laughs) <laughs> the community discovered the altar was gone the pole was cut down and the remnants of a sacrifice had been made on a new altar we need to figure this out and an investigation took place immediately and the problem with, with this story is there's at least 11 people that know exactly what went on only takes one of them to blab. There could have been ten of them blabbing. <laughs> it only took one, but there could have been ten, ten mouths blabbing. <laughs> Gideon's father was called out and said, bring out your son. He deserves to die for what he's done to the altar. And dad, <laughs> I'm sure he wasn't quite okay. I'm sure he was kind of mad. He's like, well, you know, if your God's a real God, let him do it himself. Because if he's not a real God, then it ain't worth it. So he basically told the men, let Baal deal with my my son, because I ain't bringing him out to you. But imagine, (laughs) imagine being the source of the blessings that are being held back. Gideon's dad had pagan altar in his town. Gideon is thought of as a great leader. Gideon is thought of as a take charge kind of guy. He's doing his chores and hiding. He's tearing down altars at night so he doesn't do it in the daylight. Not all courage is out in the open. All right. This story is found in two Gospels, Mark 5 and Matthew 9. I have uh, elected for this morning's message to read those out of Mark. Um, There's a little more detail. It's a little more fun. It's a story you guys have all heard. It's a fun story. We love this story. Starting at verse 21, when Jesus had crossed over again by the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the sea. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus Everyone say Jarius. That was kind of weak. Let's do it again. Everyone say Jarius. All right. Came when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and knelt and kept begging him. My little daughter is at death's door. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may get well and live. All right. I want to stop here because I want to elaborate on Jarius. Who is the biggest critics of Jesus? The Pharisees, Sadducees, the synagogue officials, the high priest. Jairus is in that group. Jairus is one of those people that you would expect to be criticizing the Messiah. But something has hit home. His daughter. His daughter is not well. And I bet you no medicine has helped. I bet you he's tried to do a lot of things. The world doesn't say that. But Jairus has to find courage to go to a man that he knows can do something for my daughter. (laughs) He knows, but everybody's against him. The Pharisees, my employer, doesn't like this man. He's got to find courage. Bear with me. Give me a little bit of grace. So Jesus went with them, and a large crowd was pressing against him. And a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. 
Having heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, touched his robe. For she said, if I can touch his robe, I will be made well. Courage. I just need to touch him. A crowd. This is an opportunity. I don't even have. This is an opportunity. I can in the crowd. and the people are rustling, bustling, going to and from, and and all I have to do is reach out and touch. I just need to reach out and touch him, and I will be made well. Just, just, just touch him. Instantly, her flow of blood ceased, and she sensed that her body was cured of her affliction. Next slide, please. At once, Jesus realized in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my robes? (laughs) His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressed against you and you say who touched me he was looking around to see who had done this then the woman knowing what had happened came with fear and trembling fell down before him and told him the whole truth I love this I have no idea how old this woman is I could venture to say she's probably a tish older than Jesus. Certainly been bleeding for 12 years, so she's well into her childbearing years. And he calls her daughter. He calls her daughter. That, that's a term of endearment. He said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be free from your affliction. While he was still speaking, people came from the synagogue leader's house, whose name is Jairus, and said, Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? But when Jesus overheard what it's what he said he told the synagogue leader do not be afraid only believe he did not let anyone accompany him except peter james and john james's brother they came into the leader's house he saw a commotion people weeping and wailing loudly He went in and said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? This child is not dead, but asleep. Let's stop there for a moment. You have to understand. We, in our our American culture, fail to glean a couple vital pieces of information from this passage. Somebody who's unclean that comes in contact with somebody who's clean cannot enter the home of a dead person. It is unethical. Jesus would not be allowed as a clean person to go into the home of a dead person. But he is able to go in there because he's touched somebody who's unclean. The woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. All right? Her touching him and that public display means that Jesus is now unclean for seven days from his contact with her. So he is now empowered to go into the home of the dead person. He started laughing at him. They started laughing at Jesus. All right. You don't believe us that she's dead? So he put them all outside. I bet Julius is desperate to a new level. 
I mean, obviously, he's already desperate enough to bring Jer uh, Jesus into his home. He's already desperate enough because he knows that the Pharisees, his boss, bosses, don't like him. He took out the children's father and mother and all those who were with him. Entered the place where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was 12 years old. This is important. The woman who had been bleeding for 12 years would not be allowed to go to the temple and worship God while she's bleeding. Jairus would not have known her or had contact with this woman for 12 years, but it's her contact that empowered Jesus to enter that home. So there's a tie in scripture for this 12-year window that brings these two focal points to the same event. At this they were astounded. Then he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this and said that she should be given something to eat. You know, when we read stories about Jesus touching people like this, it moves us to a new level of compassion. But in the, the details, we find a lot of different things at motion here. It took a lot of courage for Jarius to go to his employer's adversary and ask for aid. It took courage for the woman who had been bleeding to seek the touch of a healer. It took courage for these things to occur. You and I read the story, we don't see that it took courage in these events. We just understand that there's somebody that wants to see a change take place. And to some extent, we see desperation in both of these stories. Desperation. Scripture uses a form of courage 47 times. That's a couple, right? Six times in the Gospels. Four times in the book of Acts. Once in Hebrews. Seven times in Joshua. We were reading through Joshua. Six times in Samuel. Six times in Chronicles. Four times in Psalms. Four more times in Moses' writing. Courage can be an internal and external. It takes courage to address our issues. <coughs> it's easy for us to get set in our ways. How many of you would ever say you are set in your way? Most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we'd say, yeah, 99% of our time we are set in our way. We have a very detailed set of routines. We are set in our way, are set in our habits, set in our concepts. We come to trust our thinking. But sometimes it's that that gets us in trouble. <laughs> Confession is good for the soul there, Fred. But sometimes when we have to deal with ourselves, like Gideon had an altar in the family's house. A family altar to a pagan god. It took courage to address that. It takes courage to break our faults that are in us. To tackle the things. We think it's reasonable of God when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We think it's reasonable for us to begin cleaning up our act. We say things like, it's a natural part of growing in Christ. Now, every once in a while, there's something in our life that holds us bound. A vice, maybe. And I like to talk about those who are addicted to, to gambling because it's an easy example. But any and all addiction that keeps you in bondage is that type of scenario where it takes courage to tackle the hard things. And it's easy not to tackle it. But as long as it's not tackled, it's bondage. 
And as long as it's not tackled, deliverance can't happen. Just as in Gideon's day, he had to tackle the foreign idol, the pagan idol in his house or household. It might have been outside the house, but he had to tackle, he had to address, he had to deal with that thing in order for the deliverance to come to the people. Because I bet you he wasn't the only one doing his chores in hiding. I bet you lots of people did their chores in hiding. It takes courage to tackle the hard things internal to us as well as external. And as we talked last week, it took courage to, for Peter to say to Jesus, if that's you walking in the water, call me to you. Come. Jesus always wants to empower our spiritual welfare. He always wants to empower our spiritual well-being. We have to be prepared to be empowered. Sometimes that's tearing down the altars in our life that are hindering our relationship with God. <coughs> if you're wondering why some of your prayers go unanswered, ask yourself, is there corruption in your thinking? Are there altars in your life that need to be torn down before the deliverance can come? Our last slide this morning. Do not be afraid to be courageous. I want you all to read that too. Lice and loud. Do not be afraid to be courageous. One more time. Do not be afraid to be courageous. Hebrews 3.6 But Christ was faithful as a son over his household. And we are that household if we hold on to the courage and the confidence in our hope firm. We need to be able to tackle the things. Again, you're not going to see God move in your life if prayer is passive and if faith is passive. Your prayers need to be active. Your faith needs to be active. You need courage to see things are tackled, both internal and external. Internal courage to remove the altars in your life, external courage to take the word of God to a lost and hurting world. We as Pentecostals believe that we are watchmen. Right? We're watchmen on the tower. We are to call out sin in our nation. We are to call out sin in our culture. We are to warn people that Jesus is coming. If you believe that Jesus is coming, there should be a sense of urgency. And if you're not functioning with a sense of urgency, you have to ask yourself, is your faith in action? Or do you lack courage? Because we need to have courage to make our faith active. We need to have courage to make our faith active. Do not be afraid to be courageous. Let's stand and